team. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dylan Rodriguez. I'm here in my capacity as co-director of the Center for Ideas and Society. Uh, I'm a professor in the Department of Black Study uh, and in the Department of Media and Cultural Studies uh, here at Riverside. Um, it's a privilege and honor to welcome you all to Hot Off the Presses featuring our colleague Fusan Wang in their uh, 2022 book published by Rutledge, A Brief Literary History of Disability. Uh, I want to open the occasion by acknowledging Rupert and Jeanette Costo's legacy of reclaiming, protecting, and sustaining Indigenous presence at UC Riverside, including epistemological, archival, and physical forms of Indigenous thought and being. The University of California is a settler colonial institution that occupies unceded land and ecologies continuously inhabited by original and ongoing human caretakers, the Kawia, Tongva, Luceno, and Serrano peoples, among others. This colonial institution continues to be populated by indigenous, aboriginal, and First Nations peoples from all over the world, many of whom are among faculty, students, and staff. UC Riverside is blocks away from the site where the Riverside Police Department stole the life of 19-year-old Taisha Miller not long before I started working here. Riverside County Sheriff's Department, with which the university has a cooperating police relationship, is regionally and nationally notorious for creating cruel and fatal conditions in local jails for people who are awaiting trial and cannot afford bail. It's a shared responsibility to address how the UC is actively complicit in long ongoing histories of anti-Black state and state condoned violence. It's thus with a sense of urgent obligation that I offer these words in place of the sanctioned so-called land acknowledgement. I'm honored to open this precious occasion by urging all of us to build on Rupert and Jeanette Costo's example by seeking new and old ways to create decolonized, abolitionist, and liberated futures. Uh, welcome. So it's a real pleasure to introduce Professor Carla Mazio from the Department of English, who will lead the discussion with Professor Wong. Professor Carla Mazio specializes in early modern literature in relationship to the history of science, medicine, and health, the history of language, media technologies, and print cultural, cultures, and the history of speech pathologies and the construction of the so-called inarticulate person or community. Her research has been supported by the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. So we all will proceed with about 30 minutes of, uh, of, a, of a lecture from Professor Wong and Professor, and Professor Mazio will follow that with, by facilitating 15 minutes or so of audience engagement. Um, please help me welcome Professor Carla Mazio. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's a real delight and honor to introduce Fusang Wang. What I, um, I need to do a little business at the beginning. Um, we don't seem to have a chat function. Um, Fusang, is there a way that we can enable a, and enable a chat function here? Um, yeah, we were trying to figure that out in the okay. beginning, but it seems like uh, we, Catherine said that it was because uh, she's running another one on uh, reproductive justice, and she was afraid of being trolled. Um, okay. okay. In the chat, so she turned off the chat. So I don't think we can undo that. All right. So we will. Um, okay. Oh, okay. but, but um, there there is the option to turn on the live captioning on Zoom. Okay. So yeah, at the bottom of your screen, if you want to turn on your live captioning, everybody should have their own capacity to do that. Just click it on show captions. I'm sorry because I was going to provide a, a text in the chat of my introduction um, and accessibility uh, text. So consider, no, I'm happy to email it um, afterwards. So I'm delighted to introduce um, Fusan Wang. Since I'm on screen now, and I will be at the very end to help moderate discussion, just wanted to start by saying, yes, I'm Carla. Thanks for the introduction. That was lovely. I go by she, her, uh, at least for now. Physically, I have short brown hair, blue eyes, white skin, I'm wearing, brown rounded glasses, a black t-shirt um, and a black jacket. And my my uh, my Zoom background is blurred. So as questions arise, I was gonna say, please feel free to put them in the chat, but um, what we'll do is at the very end, um, just, it looks like we have a nice group here. It can be pretty informal, just um, signal either a, a physical desire on screen to ask a question or uh, raise that virtual hand. Um, Fu Sun Wang uh, teaches in the Department of English here at UCR. His scholarship, as I think you'll, you'll begin to glean today, bridges fields of romanticism, uh, medical and health humanities, um, and disability studies, as well as literary history. Um, while serving as co-director of UCR's new and still emergent medical and health humanities minor, which coordinates with 12 departments 
um, and the medical school to develop courses. Fusan is also the recipient of a wide range of grants. Most remain for today is a brand new three-year University of California multi-research, multi-campus research program grant entitled Abolition Medicine and Disability Justice. Um, here you see R is partnering with colleagues on the grant at UCI, UCLA, UCSC, UCSF. Um, and so hopefully at the end of today, maybe Fusan, you want to say a little bit uh, about that grant. Uh, Fusan is an inveterate collaborator, very generous, very brilliant, and I'm honored to be a collaborator uh, colleague with him on both of those projects. So since joining UCR in 2016, Fusan has completed uh, not one, uh, but two monographs and um, published very, very widely, um, is already extremely well known uh, across a number of different fields. But the first monograph is entitled The Smallpox Report, Vaccination and Romantic Illness Narrative. And that is forthcoming any moment now uh, from the University of Toronto Press. And this book argues that the eradication of smallpox in the Romantic period was as much a triumph of literary imagination as it was a scientific achievement. And I'm quoting Fusan there. He does so by John, he does this, how do you do this? He generates, he, 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 he argues this by identifying a genre of romantic medico literary fiction, um, which he argues was successfully able to imagine and then implement vaccination. Uh, what's really interesting about this book so much is really moves away from narratives of biopower and biopolitics that have dominated critical discourses about inoculation, um, turns instead to thinking about to ambient knowledge, thinking about the history of medicine or medical history from the bottom up. And I think overall that book makes a really compelling case for why romanticism you know, between the Enlightenment, between and the Victorian, why Romanticism is so useful and important for understanding the development of modern Western medicine, and why literature in particular is an essential part of the history of health and disability. Which brings us to his second book in order of composition, although the first to hit print and that we're all here to discuss and celebrate and think about today. And that is <clears throat> entitled A Brief Literary History of Disability, um, just published at the end of 2022 uh, with Rutledge, who has long um, been one of the premier presses in disability studies. Um, this book it offers a very innovative and capacious introduction to literature, literary history, and disability studies at once. How do you do that? By pairing foundational texts and theories in disability studies with well-known texts in the history of literature that are organized chronologically from the early modern to the contemporary, Fusan provides an introduction to literary as well as disability studies in this book, while modeling scholarship in various ways that can operate at the intersection of those fields. This book is the first of its kind that aims to help teachers of literature bring disability studies into the classroom. His talk for today um, addresses, I think, three very big questions about the book, which is why do we even need <laughs> literary history of disability? What counts as the literature of disability? And why even talk about a literary aesthetic of disability? Um, and with that, Fusan, the floor is yours. It's an honor to introduce you. Thank, thank you, Carla, for that introduction. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now for the PowerPoint slides. Um, and I have turned on live captioning um, for the PowerPoint slides. Can everyone see that? Thumbs up? Yes? Okay, great. Um, so, uh, as way of introduction, I'll, I'll say again, just reintroduce myself. I'm Fusan Wang. My pronouns are he and him. 
Um, I have short black hair, I'm wearing glasses, and I have on a collared shirt with the flamingo pattern. Um, and for some reason, the lighting has made me very red. I don't know why I'm so red right now. Um, but that's, that's, that's the visual description. Um, so I just want to begin by saying how grateful I am to CIS um, for inviting me to this. And uh, special thanks to Catherine Henshaw, who couldn't be here uh, because she's running another meeting right now. Uh, for arranging everything and for Carla Mazio uh, for the really generous introduction. Uh, so right now I'm just, I'm very excited to share with you uh, my new book and uh, to try to convince uh, more people of the value of disability studies and the medical and health humanities. I really hope this book, A Brief Literary History of Disability, will help bring disability studies to many more literature classrooms. Um, so as, as Carla mentioned, this book, uh, the, the kind of structure of this book is to pair uh, foundational contemporary disability theorists with some of the most well-known novels, plays, short stories, memoirs, and poems in literary history. Um, so it has a kind of very um, almost like conventional literary historical organization and a kind of canonical archive because it's meant to bring all of this, uh, bring DS study, uh, DS into the literature classroom. It's kind of pragmatically focused in that way. So the, the monograph is divided into six literary periods that you can see. I'm trying to, there we go. Um, that, that, that you can, uh, this is uh, just a visual um, of, the, um, of the table of contents and with six chronological literary periods, early modern, 18th century, romantic, Victorian, modernism, postmodernism, and contemporary. Um, so this relatively new field of literary uh, disability studies has been focus primarily on current debates and issues, but this monograph, I think, is the first book-length treatment on the deeper literary history of disability. Um, so just to give you a little bit about the origin story here, it's, it's relatively weird. It turns out that the pandemic shaped an unplanned manuscript for me. Um, so just a little story time here. I, I was part of the 2019-2020 fellowship cohort at the Huntington Library. Um, I was there trying to answer my research question about how to write disability history. How can past experiences and expressions of disabled lives be recovered when that record arrives to us distorted, buried, and rewritten to suit normative tastes and politics? Um, what I found at the Huntington were frustrating archival silences that I struggled to amplify and animate. Jane Austen's brother George, for example, had been separated from his seven siblings because of a mental disorder. Uh, the sense I got from the Huntington's wonderfully extensive collection of the Lee family letters, um, the, that's the maternal side of Jane Austen's family, was that George was to be neither seen nor talked about. And even now, he is the only Austen sibling still without a Wikipedia page. When the fellows were asked to leave our offices ahead of schedule before our research questions could be answered, um, pandemic necessity forced me to write a very different book, um, and reflect more deeply on my foundational question about disability history. Uh, instead of looking to historically appropriate documents as I was used to doing, I found unexpected inspiration in modern disability theory, black feminism, and queer historiographies. Uh, for Christina Sharp's In the Wake on Blackness and Being 2016, for example, uh, writing a history of blackness has not meant conventional archival work, but what she calls wake work, a kind of resistance that riffs creatively and anachronistically on the titular word. Wake can mean the perturbed path behind a slave ship, along the Middle Passage, a funereal rite to memorialize the casualties in the ship's hold, or a clarifying arrival to consciousness and conscience. This anachronistic shifting between historical archive and contemporary theory and creative practice has shown up in the most impactful recent histories of Blackness, and it also shows up in the strategic anachronisms of recent queer historiographies. I learned from these authors that recovering Black, queer, or disabled histories should not hinge solely on strict adherence to a surviving historical archive that is systemically inflected by violence and erasure. So instead of an ar ar archival study of romantic era disability, then the pandemic shaped for me a more speculative history that paired foundational contemporary disability theory with the literary historical past. I, I think if I hadn't been forced to rethink everything at that point, uh, my, my book would have been much more like Isaka Joshua's recent book, Physical Disability in British Romantic Literature, published in 2020 uh, with Cambridge. 
Uh, so she began uh, this book in the British archives well before the pandemic. Um, it's, it is steeped in the intricate minutia of period specific group terms around the modern concept of disability. The book has succeeded wonderfully, I think, in making the most out of those archival silences in disability history. Uh, so this important work of historical disambiguation of what we now call disability convinces me that we need both kinds of disability history. Uh, Sharp's wake work and Joshua's archive work. Uh, the overall method and argument of Joshua's book is one of a generative disambiguation of terms. She says, quote, this book challenges the use of the modern concept of disability in discussions of romantic era literature and argues that additional value is gained by using group terms rooted in the period. If we just export our own definitions to our readings of romantic era literature, she argues, our subjective meta narratives in disability studies will flatten out historical nuance. Uh, the book is always quick to root out these anachronisms throughout. So there were at least two answers to my research question about how to write disability history at this point. And in the end, the pandemic in a certain sense made the choice for me. I couldn't do a great job with Joshua's archival method since the archives were closed. Uh, so I went, the route, I went the route of acknowledging the inevitability of anachronism and creatively and theoretically amplifying that. Uh, Joshua's archival argument, I think, is not completely incompatible with Sharp's creatively anachronistic wake work, even though Joshua abhors an anachronism. The historicist's warning, however, is well taken, and writing the history of disabled people will continue to require both Joshua's corrective archive and Sharp's reparative anachronism. Now, amazing and important work is now being done in the field of literary disability studies, and academics and students alike, I think, have taken notice. That excitement is evident here at UCR, where I am co-directing with Carla Mazio, the, uh, the undergraduate minor in medical and health humanities studies. And uh, part of the reason I wanted to do this talk for CIS is to advertise this new MHHS minor. Um, I'll be teaching the intro course MHHS 1 and English 141 on literature and disability uh, next quarter and in fall 2023. Uh, so please get the word out about this, uh, about the MHHS minor, especially for spring quarter, because I don't, I really don't want an empty classroom come April. Um, so interest in medical humanities, um, that, that interest, interest in disability studies, um, all of that tends to cluster around very contemporary literature and modern public policy. Um, uh, what this book does instead is to direct that palpable excitement uh, about these issues into a deeper historical archive of literary represent representations of disability. Now, how we assemble that literary historical archive of disability is the next big question. And this book I'm sort of imagining as a first attempt of assembling that archive. Now, to make the book's contributions as transparent as possible, I boiled down my ideological framework into three big questions, a why, a what, and a how. Uh, these are questions I hear frequently when teaching, discussing, presenting, and publishing research in the field of literary disability studies. Um, the first question is an em eminently pragmatic one. Why do we even need a, history, a literary history of disability? After all, according to this question's insistent subtext, Disability has always meant more or less the same thing. It is about a missing limb, a malformed organ, or some sort of prosthetic, a crutch, a wheelchair, a cochlear implant. Uh, behind, uh, beyond mere passing interest, what use is it to stretch out this ostensibly stable story of human suffering across literary history? Blindness during the Enlightenment era, for example, may be important to document, but perhaps not that complicated. And even if it is complicated, surely there are more important matters to of contemporary public policy to tackle, such as the troubled legacy of the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. Yes, um, those discussions are important, but so are discussions about our cultural constructions of and attitudes about disability that led to something like the ADA. Disability studies as a field is relatively new. Um, it is a field that only fully took off um, probably after the ADA, and perhaps because of that, the field dwells, I think, right now in ideological presentism. Um, a brief literary history of disability suspends for a moment that teleological orientation towards the present in favor of developing a longer literary history of disability, a literary history that turns out to be much more unstable than just wheelchairs and cochlear implants. 
The second question is a what. Uh, what counts as the literature of disability? If the literary history of disability goes back centuries, as I'm claiming, then what shall be that literary history's archive? And how should we expand the archive without just replicating our contemporary assumptions about disability? It is not as simple, for example, as just looking back in literary history for wheelchairs and artificial limbs. Instead, uh, the archive must uh, strategically move beyond the usual suspects. Archival methodologies and disability studies tend to fall into two camps. The first is about random discovery. One of the guiding principles of disability studies is that representation is everywhere but historically ignored. Disability is not a minority discourse in the statistical sense. The chances are that most lives and most stories are somehow touched by disability issues. Um, if I ask this group or any group, um, I'm pretty sure we've just run out of time telling these personal stories about our lives. Uh, random discovery means picking through the literary historical archive arbitrarily and exposing all those ignored elements of disability representation. For a brief literary history of disability, however, I have chosen a second archival strategy. Uh, for the sake of cl clarity, brevity, and coherence, mine is a much more targeted search. In 12 brief chapters, I have curated a group of texts that represents a generous span of literary history from early modern to contemporary. I've chosen to tell a story of how our most well-known and influential memoirs, short stories, novels, poems, and plays have changed our perceptions of disability across literary historical time. Curation, however, always implies archival omission. And so the hope is that those omissions in my brief literary history will motivate and sustain new canonical formations in literary disability studies. Uh, the third is the third how question is a foundational one about the connection of literature and disability. Um, how shall we connect literary or imaginative production with the re very real embodied uh, the with with very real embodied disability issues? Uh, should we even talk about a literary aesthetic of disability? Uh, what have been the benefits and risks of literary representation of disability? So uh, these are the main questions, the, the, the how question, right? In, in this literary historical archive, has literature on the balance done more harm than good? Um, on the one side of this thorny question is Susan Sontag's polemical warning against illness metaphors. Aestheticizing illness and disability, according to Sontag, damages the real lived experience of an unhealthy body. Um, on the other side of the question is Tobin Sievers' discussion of the aesthetic potential of disability. Sontag rejects metaphorical thinking when dealing with illness or disability because in the cases of cancer and HIV AIDS, metaphor distracts and distorts the real and uh, dist distorts the real and encourages patients to indulge in dangerous magical thinking. In, Tob in Tobin Sievers' formulation though, the idea of the real is much more nebulous, especially when it comes to disease and disability. Metaphor might be one of the primary ways we can think about disability. So the goal is to find the tools to express ourselves without recourse to ableism or prejudice and to find a socially just way to represent the sick or disabled body. This book survey of literary history, the, of the literary history of disability is much more sympathetic to Siebers than to Sontag on these aesthetic issues. Uh, throughout, I uncover our enduring literary metaphors of disability to learn from both the historical harm of ableist literature and the more generous and hopeful rewritings of the parameters of human flourishing. Um, so that's, that's the argument and method of the book in a nutshell, but I think it'll be much clearer with an example. So for the rest of the talk, um, I'm gonna feature Herman Melville's 1853 short story, Bartleby the Scrivener, um, a work that's the, at the center of chapter nine of my book, along with Irving Goffman's sociological work in 1963 that culminated in his book, Stigma Notes on the Management of Spoiled Identity. Um, I chose this chapter's pairing of Melville and Goffman for the talk because Bartleby is one of the most well-known pieces of, of fiction in American history, and Stigma is one of the foundational works of sociological thinking about difference. This chapter also models very clearly how reading disability in the past can't be a neutral thing. Something like Asaka Joshua's prescriptivist historicism sort of implies that we can't, that we can go back to the past and objectively, or at least moderately successfully, 
uh, recover precise historical meanings uh, around disability representation. Um, I'll be interested uh, to hear how others have taught the story, but in my experience, there's been very little success in capturing this objective uh, medical sense of historical disability representation, especially with this short story. Um, for me, there's been a clear trend in how students have um, encountered the story. I started teaching the story about a decade ago when I was a graduate student at UCLA. And what I found then was that students really wanted to take sides in the story. It was team boss or team employee. When I taught it back then, almost everyone was team boss. Uh, that guy had bent over backwards trying to help his employee Bartleby in the office, and there was no more he could have done, uh, and there was no way he could have prevented Bartleby's death. More recently, and I have fewer data points for this, um, it seems more students are siding with Bartleby um, as mainstream culture is talking about the great resignation and the phenomenon of quiet quitting. Students have been switching allegiances, and I think a lot of it has to do with our own shifting attitudes about disability, mental health, and workplace accommodation. What I'm claiming here is that we can't recover some correct objective view of historical disability. Uh, what we see in the past will always be inflected by what we experience in the present. Um, so to show this, I want to rewind to a different time when Irving Goffman was pu puzzling through the question, what even is stigma? Um, in 1963, he was trying to build a kind of working definition of modern stigma. What he came up with is that stigmatized individuals move through the world with visual markers that conveniently label their bodies and minds with something unusual and bad. Um, unlike with the interpretive pseudoscience of physiognomy or phrenology, Stigma is meant to be an easily legible marker for everyone to read the moral status of the signifier. Melville's first person narrator, I'm arguing, is this Goffman-like sociologist of stigma. When his employee Bartleby says, I would prefer not to, uh, the narrator boss does all he can do to manage and accommodate his, uh, his employee's spoiled identity. The narrator's sociological or anthropological interventionism centers his own first person perspective as a kind of compassionate boss who is trying to discipline and accommodate an employee. And this is what Goffman is driving at in his subtitle Notes on the Management of Spoiled Identity. Um, this is very clearly the implication there. From the very beginning, Goffman makes clear his scientific disciplinary stance on the issue of stigma. As a proper sociologist, he dutifully defines his term with reassuring precision. Uh, now, before getting to the spoiled identity of the subtitle, Goffman defines a social identity as both the personal attributes of an individual and the structural imputations on the individual. It is, in other words, how a person lives and interacts um, in a social world. He distinguishes between what he calls a virtual social identity and an actual social identity. Virtual social identity encompasses all unproven and un un unempirical characterizations of the individual, while an actual social identity represents only the empirical, provable, and objective attributes of the individual. And when Goffman refers to his titular subject, stigma, he means an undesired discrepancy between virtual social identity and actual social identity. Now, notice that this all just sounds like a very careful way of defining what is already a, kind of a common sense notion about stigma. And Goffman's real task in this work is to define the precise mechanisms of stigma to expose all its sociological functions. And finally, as his subtitle advertises, offer some management advice about spoiled identity. And we're all now used to talking about social constructions with a lot of skepticism about the real, um, or the actual, but back in 1963, however, Goffman could talk about something like, quote, an actual social identity that is empirical, provable, and real. Uh, Goffman has a supreme faith in a kind of realism that is sociological, um, empirical, objective, provable, all that stuff, right? Because of this unabashed and apologetic commitment to that real, uh, he pitches his study with a bluntness that borders on bluster, quote, he possesses uh, a stigma, an undesired differentness from what we had anticipated. We and those who do not, do not depart negatively from the particular expectations at issue, I shall call the normals. Um, so with 
little self-reflection, Goffman swiftly identifies himself as one of these normals uh, with this first person plural we uh, scattered haphazardly along his supposedly scientific study. He is normal and he expects his reader to be as normal as he is. He is an objective sociologist looking from the outside into a subculture of stigmatized individuals. Goffman's we assumes that he is talking to other normals and not, for example, what he strikingly calls at one point, quote, mental defectives. He concludes that we normals are not accustomed to dealing with the uncomfortable situations that arise from encountering stigmatized individuals. He needs to write this book then as a kind of manual for uh, a, a manual by a normal for normals to deal with non normals the uh, the mixed contact, as he calls it, in the encounter between we normals and a stigmatized individual stage is what he calls the primal scene of sociology. Um, in his ethnographical approach, he details several examples of how cripples, and these are his words, cripples, mental defectives, uh, polio victims, and people with misshapen features cope with their stigma and how, quote, we normals can handle the unsettling encounter with these unfortunates. Of interest uh, to the reading of Bartleby that follows might be this vignette um, about this vignette um, about an employee not wishing to feel stigmatized in the workplace. Quote: Minor failings or incidental impropriety may, he feels, be interpreted as a direct expression of his stigmatized differentness. Ex-mental patients, for example, are sometimes afraid to engage in sharp interchanges with spouse or employer because of what a show of emotion might be taken as a sign for of. Um, mental defectives face a similar contingency. From his perspective, Goffman glosses the abnormal mindset that produces what may look like inexplicable behavior to we normals. The strange reluctance, quote, to engage in sharp interchanges in the workplace could be, Goffman explains, misconstrued as an antisocial or standoffish personality. Instead, Goffman inhabits his subject's defective mind to uh, understand and empath empathize with the wish to minimize, uh, to, uh, to, to minimize the exposure of his stigmatized differentness. Bartleby's seemingly resistant and cold response, I would prefer not to, can then be reinterpreted by we normals as a coping mechanism to hide the shame of, quote, minor failings or incidental impropriety. Um, Goffin's sociological manual for mixed contest, contact is steadfastly utilitarian throughout. It offers an exhaustive catalog of the mysterious behaviors of stigmatized individuals so that we normals know what to expect. It is a well-intentioned study that strives to find a way to reintegrate those who have suffered the social exile of stigma. Um, I began with Goffman's limited normative perspective on stigma because it contextualizes the strangely obsessive narrator of Melville's short story, Bartleby the Scrivener. Since uh, the narrator gets no show of, uh, gets no quote show of emotion or response to his efforts to welcome Bartleby in the, in the office, he must fashion his own ethnography of stigma to explain the inexplicable behavior of his newest employee. He thought that he had been a good boss and was more than fair with his other employees, even if they were slacking off. He tries everything in Goffman's manual to accommodate the mental defective Bartleby. He is um, a Goffman bravely stepping into this primal scene of sociology with the best of intentions. Uh, Melville's purpose here is to satirize uh, the social sociologist narrator and his demands for the productive labor of his newest employee, Bartleby. Melville himself is closer to the iconoclasm of Bartleby than to the dutiful normativity of the narrator. So it's important to note, as, remind, as we remind our students all the time, that Melville himself is not the narrator. Um, the short story um, originally appeared in an 1853 issue of Putnam's Magazine. The date is important because of some world-shaking history that had just occurred. Karl Marx had just published his Communist Manifesto in 1848. Henry David Thoreau had just published his essay on civil disobedience in 1849. And in the same year, violence had erupted in the Astor Place Riot. The Astor Place Riot, referenced directly in Melville's short story, is a remarkable story in itself, um, but I won't get into it. It's just a dispute about the relative merits of two Shakespearean actors, the American 
uh, Edwin Forrest and the British William Charles McCree, uh, erupted into class warfare and nativist violence that left dozens dead and over 100 injured. Uh, Marx had laid the ideological framework uh, for the necessity of class struggle. Thoreau had adv advocated nonviolent protest, and the Astor Place riot showed how class struggle can erupt beyond Thoreauvian nonviolence. The problem was what Marx would later call the, um, the alienation of labor, the estrangement of the individual from the world in which she lives and her means of production. Uh, 19th century literature began representing these forms of alienated labor, of people disconnecting from the means of production and becoming mere automata in the assembly line of capitalist society. Uh, Dickens's response was social satire in the social realist novel um, that exposed the impoverished conditions of, for example, the Cratchit family in A Christmas Carol. Melville's proto-modernist style, however, tried to give the alienation of labor a more abstract aesthetic form by showing how strange actual resistance to capitalism would look like. It would look like Bartleby's inscrutable, I would prefer not to. Um, the narrator's outwardly philanthropic goal is to figure out and accommodate that inscrutable Bartleby, that, uh, out, that outlier of unproductive labor on Wall Street. But systemically, it is much more about bringing him into the fold. The capitalist must successfully decode the cipher and put it to work. Bartleby, the narrator constantly insists, must have a productive use value. Now, when I teach Melville's short story outside a disability theory context, students, um, as I've mentioned, tend to side with, or at least sympathize with the narrator's efforts to make room for Bartleby in the Wall Street office. Along with the narrator, they feel frustrated about Bartleby's uncommunicative behavior and his refusal to the, do the job he's being paid to do. Now, because a lot of the students I've taught are first generation college students like myself who come from pragma pragmatic minded and working class backgrounds, just doing the job has been a structural necessity. Within a disability theory context, however, we discover the extent to which we had uh, bought into the equation of productive use value uh, and human flourishing. Goffman's stigma, for example, thinks of accommodation in exactly those terms. Uh, he presents himself as the even-handed sociologist who is trying his darndest to transform the stigmatized individual into a productive member of society. Now, disability theorists like Alison Kafer have taught us instead to delay, halt, and question that seemingly auspicious transformation by reorient reorienting capitalism's naturalized rhythms of production. In defining this concept of crip time, Kafer moves beyond the, the idea of mere accommodation. Instead of just the flex time afforded to students and employees with disabilities, crip time is a more structural reorganization of our human rhythms. In this sense, neither Goffman's assimilation of the stigmatized individual into a normative society, nor the narrator's success in getting Bartleby to write some copy is an occasion for celebration or a congratulatory pat on the back. Crip time means centering a Bartleby as an occasion to rethink assumptions and expectations of what human minds and bodies are supposed to do. Melville's inventive strategy in the short story is to deny us entirely this desired voice of crip time beyond the narrator's insistence on his self-congratulatory flex time. The narrator deliberately characterizes himself as a relatable everyman and coaxes his audience into applauding his accommodating nature. Meanwhile, Bartleby's voice is limited to selective quotations and a, and a secondhand story about imprisonment, starvation, and death. Melville gradually intensifies the desire for the marginalized voices to speak against all the distorting voices that speak for them. Instead of listening to the narrator's endless speculations about Bartleby, we want to hear from Bartleby himself. In centering the first person perspective of crypt time, Ellen Samuels, in her creative nonfiction essay, offers us an example of the voice that Melville's narrator consistently denies us. Instead of the babbling narrator, here's the kind of first person voice that Melville makes us desperate to hear. Quote, and on a deeper level, being a crypt vampire spins me back into that whirlpool of time travel. I look 25, feel 85, and just want to live like the other 40-somethings I know. I want to be aligned, synchronous, part of the regular order of the world. Like the leaves that just now turning as the year spins toward its end, 
I want sometimes to be part of nature, to live within its time. But I don't. My life has turned another way. I live in crypt time now. Samuels transposes Goffman's we normals into the first person singular of I look, I know, I want, I live. Instead of Melville's sociologist narrator peering into stigmatized lives to find the most, the most efficient ways to allocate um, flex time, Samuels extends an intimate invitation into her, her own first person experience of living in crypt time. Melville slowly turns up the volume of this unsettlingly absent voice in his short story until we can almost hear it through the narrator's noisy demands for productive labor. Now, as I mentioned before, when I teach the, when I teach the story outside a disability context, students will frequently accept the narrator as a mostly reliable storyteller. They will sympathize with his Herculean efforts to bring Bartleby into the fold and argue that he learns a valuable lesson about how to care for a sick person, even if he proves to be beyond saving. They will even get frustrated with Bartleby for his baffling intransigence, while the narrator is anointed a saint for his incredible patience. I now believe that the problem was that I had taught the story as a classic critique of capitalism. The brilliance of the story, it turns out, is that Melville's critique of capitalism is also a prescient disability critique. What ultimately gets readers of Melville's short story to turn against the narrator is the realization that he is not just the epitome of a predatory capitalist, but an Irving Goffman, a self-identified normal sociologist who is trying to standardize the accommodative protocols of what he calls mixed contact between the stigmatized and the non-stigmatized. The disabling nature of late capitalism was only truly visible when I started to center disability. So under the noise of his loquacious narrator, um, Melville yearns for new theoretical orientations like the pragmatic concept of Kafer's and Samuels's crypt time. Melville was a modernist before modernism and a disability theorist before disability theory allowing for something like Christina Sharp's anachronistic wake work and suspending for a moment Isaka Joshua's historicist imperative of archival work allows us to appreciate how Melville developed strange new narrative protocols of disability representation while centering real issues that affected disabled lives, accommodation in the workplace, injustice in the judicial system, the prison industrial complex, and the fundamental ways to view and experience human flourishing in the world. Thank you, that's it. Okay, lots of claps and, and um, thank you so much, Fusan. I think at this point, um, if folks wanna um, raise their, their virtual hand, um, to join in and, and ask a question. We've got 10 minutes and I think uh, Fusan, you, you should feel free to uh, moderate. So it's, a, it's a nice small group um, and we've got, we've got 10 minutes. So um, I, I, I do really want to hear how, I, I know probably a lot of people here have taught Bartleby and I, I do want to hear like what their experience is. I don't know if my experience is atypical or typical, but that, that was just my experience teaching the story. <laughs> Go ahead, Catherine. Um, thank you, Fusan, for that. That was amazing. I mean, it was a wonderfully clear presentation and so exciting. Um, since you asked for Bartleby recommendations, yeah, I, I mean, I've taught it for more than 10 years um, um, in the Americanist context, and there are because it is true, there's, there's just so much frustration about the uninterpretability of, of Bartleby, right? Um, but I think you're right that they have gotten increasingly savvy about the critique of the narrator, right? It's, it's not so much he's a rapacious capitalist, he's incompetent and feels like he's entitled <laughs> to all the profits of their labor, right? It's a kind of double whammy. He's not a, he, he wants to be a middling lawyer or something right but um but I was struck I don't know if you know um Benito Serino but the the parallel right where it has the same um sort of fatuous white liberal 
esque narrator, but the the object of interpretation at that point is the reversal of slave and master. Um, and it's just a really lovely parallel, I think, to to what you're thinking about. But but yeah, no, I thought you I thought it's a great reading. Um, yeah. Thank well, you. yeah, thank you for that recommendation, actually, because uh, in the longer version, it, well, in the chap in chapter nine of the book, um, I do do a brief reading of Billy Budd, actually, um, but um, not not for Benito Serino. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to look at that as well. I think uh, I haven't read Benito Serino for like I, the last time I read it was probably like 20 years ago. <laughs> um, so I don't remember it that well. <laughs> Oh, uh, Car Carlos, go ahead. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. I just, that, that was fabulous, absolutely. And let me ask a very, very specific question. As you know, uh, I teach in the health equity dimension of the uh, medical school here, here at UCR. And I wonder if you could just speculate how what you just talked about would apply or could be applied through medical education, because I know you raised the issue of the offhandedly of the Americans with Disability Act. I wonder if you might just apply this, just go any way you want. Yeah, um, I think um, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about this a lot right now because I'm I'm working on the uh, Intro to Medical and Health Humanities uh, Studies minor right now. And I'm going to be teaching it in the spring. So again, a plug for people to advertise it, to make, sure, make sure there are students in my class in April. <laughs> Um, so I, I'm thinking about this question a lot right now and thinking about um, what the humanities have to offer, right, when it comes to medical education. Um, and I think it is, um, applying it to what I was talking about in this talk, is that it's maybe not taking like someone like Irving Goffman at his word, right? Not, not, not taking Irving, Irving Goffman's notion of like how to manage a spoiled identity as a kind of medical truth, or as a kind of like discourseless discourse about um, what it means to be healthy, what it means to be normal, what it means to be non-stigmatized, right? Um, so that um, students, for example, uh, like I, I, I mean, in the MHHS course that I'm imagining, I, what I really want them to get um, from the course is that um, all of these things about the healthy body, about treatment, about disease, these are culturally contingent um, aspects of our bodies, right? And these are things that have constantly been negotiated, have constantly been thought about in different ways. Um, whereas uh, the kind of Foucauldian notion of the clinic is closed off to all that. The, it, it's it's um, sort of this closing off of discourse about that healthy body. Um, and so sometimes students will take something like Irving Goffman's notion of the non-stigmatized body as gospel, right? This is this is what a normal body looks like. This is how to deal with non-normals. These are the protocols of that encounter. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I guess maybe in teaching this story, um, I would get them to see that there are there are more complexities to that encounter than what Irving Goffman allows. Oh, I think I see Andre's hand. Yeah, thank you. Um, that was wonderful. Uh, it was really great. And um, it just seems like this is such a, a necessary and a timely intervention. Um, I wonder uh, if you can just say more about how um, how you employ the the notion of crip time. Because, um, I, you know, I've encountered it in some ways kind of at the like conjunction of queer and crip studies and I I struggle specifically to make it teachable. And I think um, you're really kind of getting it exactly there, like exactly because it's a way to teach like how to interpret what we're reading differently. Um, and I wonder if you can just say more about it. Yeah, um, and I think, yeah, I think definitely, yeah, connecting crypt time with pedagogy is really important because um, I think it's eminently teachable crypt time just because I, students are already are always talking about how they need more time on their assignments, right? So they already have this kind of embedded notion of, you know, things take different times for different people, right? Um, so they have that kind of notion embedded in their own kind of work already. Um, and um, 
you know, and seeing it play out, I think, in the story is, is like a great way to teach script time. That, that um, even though Melville doesn't have that language, and this is what I mean about that kind of anachronistic wake word, um, Melville doesn't have that language, but I think that's exactly what he's trying to articulate here um, in denying us that first person voice of like, um, obviously there's something else going on here, right? We don't know um, what kind of rhythms Bartleby works in. Uh, we don't understand his subjectivity. Um, and that absence is deafening, I think. In, sorry, that's probably a bad word to use in this context. Um, that, that absence is, um, I don't know, some other word. <laughs> um, that, that, that absence is, is, is made you know, prominent um, in, in, the, um, in, in the story and makes us want to hear that voice of crypt time, even though it's not articulated. That's why I, I brought in that voice of Alison Kafer and that voice of Ellen Samuels, because they so beautifully and clearly articulate what that um, what that absent voice is, um, and um, I think just hearing them talk about it um, is very clarifying when reading this this, this story about Bartleby because um, I want students to get to hear that voice that that absent voice um, and Melville like frustratingly doesn't give it to us. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Carl. I've got a follow up to that, um, and again, you know, beautiful, beautiful talk, uh, introduction to the book. Follow up on and Andre's question. I wonder how you might, hypothetically, or actually, um, in practice or in theory, apply crypt time to periodization. That is, apply crypt time to the very idea of anachronism in and of itself, right? Or literary periodization. So, um, you know, your book by necessity goes from early modern to contemporary um, as a matter of practice. And I keep thinking about the debates in my field around the way in which periodization is implicitly um, antithetical to, uh, and has been, to really very strong and important work in critical race studies, right? What might be, and as you know, um, and so, so what might be uh, relationships, and this is, really something, a genuine question between um, periodization and either ableism or crypt time. Yeah, um, and I, I see Josh Prindle is here. So <laughs> let me just give a shout out to his work here. Um, his, uh, so I remember reading an essay of his about um, the idea of like using the idea of crypt time in terms of the, the Gordon riots um, in the late 18th century. Um, and this notion of like this kind of, this very kind of hyper able notion of revolutionary time right of, of like this revolutionary moment at the 18 at the end of the 18th century where uh we had this this age of revolutions like the american revolution the french revolution the haitian revolution um all these revolutions that were operating in this kind of fantastically quick time to change the world um but um uh J josh's uh josh's essay well, like wonderfully illuminates how Dickens like sort of challenges that kind of revolutionary time with the figure of Barnaby Rudge, um, this kind of, um, as you know, Goffman would probably put it, a mental defective, um, who uh, experiences uh, time differently, who experiences the rhythms of change differently. Um, so um, I think, you know, in terms of periodization, we do tend to think in terms of revolutions, wars, right, things that are world shaking kind of historical events that propel change in a kind of normative vision of, um, of temporality. Um, so um, I think crip time would probably help us, you know, rethink these things, right? Uh, I mean, Barnaby Rudge probably experienced the French Revolution differently. He experienced the Gordon riots differently. Um, and um, I would say also just about periodization, um, just, uh, I mean, Carla and I talked about this a little bit beforehand, but uh, just in terms of periodization, there's a very kind of like weirdly traditionalist or conventionalist structure of this book. Like I, I use like very old fashioned, like here's 18th century, here's enlightenment, here's romantic, here's Victorian, th these very kind of old fashioned notions about periodization. And I also take on an archive of very canonical texts, right? And part of that is a kind of pragmatic reason, right? The, the kind of purpose of the book is to bring disability studies into as many literature classrooms as possible, right? It's such just that um, you could, uh, for, for, for a lot of disability activists, any archive is a disability archive, right? Because disability representation is everywhere. Um, so um, the pragmatic focus of this book is 
to get people to see that, right? To, to get people to see that, you know, you can teach Bartleby, which is something you probably already do. <laughs> you can teach Bartleby um, and you can talk about disability studies, right? Um, the, and it's a perfect way to sort of bring disability studies into your classroom, right? You can teach Frankenstein or you can teach um, A Christmas Carol, right? The, uh, you can teach Sherlock Holmes. These are like the most widely circulated stories that we have, right? <laughs> Um, you can teach all these uh, these stories that we teach all the time um, and teach it in a different way, where right? bring disability studies into it. Thank you so much. Um, speaking of time limitations, Dylan, do you want, and we're getting to that minute, do you want to um, bring us to a close? Thank you so much, Ruslan. No, this has been really wonderful. Um, I, I was just joking with Carla and Tucson before the event began that um, I feel like a student of disability studies and disability justice and abolitionist practice in particular. So this is really, um, I learned a lot from, from this last hour. Uh, much appreciation to Kusan for writing this book. Um, thank you, Carla, for facilitating this. And thank you to y'all for coming through. I love these events. Um, and uh, this will be recorded. It'll be online. Y'all can direct your people to it. Um, so thank you for coming through, everybody.